Hi, Eddie. Today we're going to speak with Mark Hunter. Mark Hunter is the sales hunter, and he is a sales and prospecting guru. He's going to speak with us about the common mistakes companies uh, make when prospecting, how much flexibility should a sales rep have on pricing, and how to successfully increase pricing to your current clients. And next week, we're going to be speaking with Michael Miucci. He's going to speak about how to set targets for your team and moving from an individual contributor to leading the sales team. Really have a great show set up for you guys today. So stay tuned and enjoy. Startup Sales is a podcast about what it's really like to get a business off the ground. We talk with founders, CEOs, and sales VPs from the high-tech market. You'll learn how to build and scale a sales team. You'll also also hear about the growth challenges and tough decisions from others who have had both successes and failures. And now, your host of the Startup Sales Podcast, Adam Springer. Hi, everyone. Before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to ask for your help. I want to hear your feedback about the podcast so that I could make it better and more relevant to you. Send me your thoughts or questions you would like to have answered to adam at startupsales.io or use the Get In Touch link on the website, startupsales.io. Of course, I am also available on LinkedIn. Just search for Adam Springer. Looking forward to delivering you more and more impactful and helpful interviews. Great, Mark. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. Great. So uh, I want to tell the guests a little bit about you and how you got into sales. Can you uh, give us that brief overview? Well, my background is that I did not want to get into sales. Oh, truth be told. Yeah, I actually went to college to get a degree in marketing. I wanted to go into advertising. And it was only because of the good fortune of running into the Seattle Police Department. Let's put it this way. I got four speeding tickets in about six weeks, which meant about six months later, I got a notice in the mail that I could no longer afford car insurance. I quickly changed my career to one that I could have a job with a car. That meant an outside sales job. That is how I wound up in sales. Wow. <laughs> so thank, thank you to the police uh, for allowing you to help everybody, all of us salespeople out with uh, all of your knowledge and experience. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we really do owe them a big favor because if it hadn't been for them, I'd be, I'd be writing ad copy in, for some obscure product somewhere in the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. Good. So I want to focus a little bit on your first, uh, I don't know if your first book, your, the first book I want to focus on is Prospecting. Uh, you have a book called High Profit Prospecting. Now, how do you plan on who, what, where, and when, when you're prospecting? Yeah, two questions anybody has to ask themselves first before they begin any level, any level of prospecting. One, what is the outcome that I can help customers achieve? In other words, after I sell to them, what is the benefit? What's the gain? What's the outcome that they receive? And then B, I then figure out, okay, who is the right type of customer that this would appeal to? When I get those two questions answered, then I can begin to realize who I should be prospecting. Because prospecting is not this, hey, let's go and send out 10,000 emails or 10,000. Forget it. Those days are long gone. You have to be very targeted. So the tighter you can figure out your outcome, the tighter you can figure out who would really best benefit from it, that allows you to narrow who you go after. Okay, but where, where do you draw the line on narrowing it too small? Well, that's, all, that's always a challenge because initially everybody wants to say, I, I want to go after everybody. And that's, that's a real tendency. And initially you are because you're actually going to be kind of fishing in a couple different ponds. Because you may have an outcome that works for this type of customer, an outcome that works for this type. So you may fish in three or four different ponds, but you're still going to be as specific and as tight as possible. Then over time, you begin to determine which pond has got the best fish. That's where you then go. That's, that's where you stay. Uh, but you have, 
I, I don't believe you can be successful by just saying, hi, I'm out here in the world, buy for me, I'm gonna make you happy. No, no, because if you do not, from a prospecting message right from the start, if you do not demonstrate how and why the customer should show interest in you, there's little reason for them to pay attention to you. Absolutely. Uh, you got to deliver value to them first before they'll listen to you. Yeah. And that, and that value is really what matters to them. It's not what matters to you. This is where so many um, companies make the mistake. They start off with this uh, capabilities type presentation. We've done this, we've done this, we've done that. I, 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 there is no prospect anywhere in the world that ever woke up and said, wow, I sure hope Mark Hunter, the sales hunter, reaches out to me today. It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. I, I, <laughs> I don't know, maybe you're a better person than I, but I'm sorry, it's not happening in my world. Yeah, no, not, not me either. They're not waiting for my phone call, sadly. All right, so let's say that uh, marketing is doing what marketing does, but we're wanting to focus on the sale end. And now we figured out who we plan on targeting. What's the next stage? How do you put together a, a plan of attack? Well, the next stage is you first of all ha have, to, have to ask yourself, when is the customer going to be willing to buy? In other words, the closer I can match the sell cycle to the buy cycle. And, and oh, let's not kid ourselves. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want to be sold to. Nobody, nobody. But they will buy. And the closer I can match my sell cycle to your buy cycle, the better. What does that mean? That means what I've got to do is I've got to find out, is there a natural season of the year? Is there a business event? Is there something that, that says you are going to be more likely to buy during this time of year? B, is this something that you buy regularly or is this something you don't buy regularly? In other words, if this is a consumable item and, you know, I, I, I'm going to message you quite a bit. If on the other hand, no, it's a, it's a, it's a buy you only make once every five years, it's going to take a different type of a uh, prospecting cycle. Third piece is really I have to begin to ask myself, is this something that you're going to switch? In other words, you're buying from somebody right now, similar type of product, and I'm asking you to switch to buy from me, or am I going to have to educate you? And if you think about it, all those factors really come into play in terms of determining what is my prospecting messaging going to be. And the closer I can match my prospecting messaging to the marketing messaging, the better off I'm going to be. Absolutely. Uh, and when you're reaching out to the people, uh, to the potential prospects, what step what kind of steps uh, are you taking? I mean, email, phone calls, things like that. Are there any other steps that you do? Well, yeah. I mean, the two main ones that I use are email and also telephone. And, and you know what? The telephone really does work. It really, it really works. People say, oh, nobody picks up the telephone. Yeah, but you know what's funny is if I do complete a phone call, I'm going to be able to have as much information exchanged in that one phone call with you as I might in four or five emails with you over the course of several weeks. So why would I not try to reach, reach you on the telephone? Now, let me back up and walk through a couple of these things because I'm going to use every technique possible. I'm going to use the telephone. I'm going to use email. I might use text messaging. I might use social media. I might use direct mail. I'm going to use whatever means, but here's the whole key point. My key point is I've got to wrap it as rapidly as possible. Figure what is your primary messaging system? I've got several customers that I work with that I only interact to them, only interact with them by way of LinkedIn. That's their preferred communication method. That's fine. I've got other prospects I've landed purely because of strictly the telephone. And really, it's the voicemail. In fact, it's interesting. I am right now prospecting with a person by way of voicemail. She does not respond to my emails, but she does respond to my voicemails by leaving me a voicemail. Now, it's funny. We have yet to talk live. We have yet to talk live, but we have now traded. In fact, I just left her another voicemail, probably my fifth voicemail, and she's left me three. So this is funny, but I'm, I'm moving her through the prospecting cycle strictly by voicemail. 
It's funny because uh, who really uses voice money anymore nowadays? Well, so you're, you're, you're saying that it works and you've got proof now that it I works. I've got proof. Now, now, again, it doesn't work with everybody, but for this particular person, it does. Now, he, here's something to keep in mind, depending on the system that you have, there's a lot of cell systems, a lot of phone systems that are now converting voicemail into text messages. So, you know, when people say oh, nobody listens to voicemail, man, I know a number of people say, yeah, I never listen. I never listen to a voicemail message because I get it as a text. Well, boy, just think about the quality of your voicemail. How does it look in a text? <laughs> does it look good or <laughs> does it look like a rambling? Way? Absolutely. It, it makes you really have to think about delivering your message in a very clear and to the point method. That is without a doubt, clear, consistent messaging is absolutely critical, regardless of what form you're using. Yeah, I, you know, something that I really like to use is, is LinkedIn. And when I message out, I, I, have, I try to keep it to about three sentences at the max and just say, hey, deliver value. And then is it okay if we speak further? And giving that permission to reject, but also delivering the value and being straight to the point really opens that door. That is with that. Let me share with you a very good LinkedIn technique that anybody can use. In fact, I just used it this morning. There's a company that I'm prospecting. I know I can have a huge impact on them. In fact, we had a conversation this morning. I got some really good information, just wasn't able to move them along as far enough as I would like to. The owner of the company, owner, CEO, is on LinkedIn because I've interacted with him a few times by way of LinkedIn. So what I did was I posted this morning five very critical questions that every small business owner, business leader should be asking themselves. Now, I just put that out there as a post. Now, I'm going to wait for a day or two to see if he sees it. If he sees it, I'm sure he's going to respond to it. What have I done? I've done a little more prospecting. And then, you know what? I'm going to be able to pick up the phone and call. Hey, I see that you saw that article. I see you saw that post I wrote. And I'm going to be able to ask him about a couple of those questions. If he doesn't, what I'll do is I'll send him a LinkedIn. Met in other words, if he doesn't respond, doesn't see that post in, in a day or two, I will send him a LinkedIn message. Hey, I posted this the other day. Thought it might be of interest thought it might be of interest to you. What am I doing? I'm using other means other than email, other than telephone, to be prospecting and engaging to be able to take this prospect and turn them into a customer. Now, how do you know if they've actually seen it besides if they've engaged in it? Well, I, I really won't know unless they hit like or they write a comment. I know this person because he's liked several other things that I've posted oh, as we've been kind of in this prospecting stage over the last month or two. So I, I get the sense that if, he, that if he reads something of mine, he's going to hit liked, say, or he's going to comment on it. So that's, that's, my own, only, that's my only valid proof. But here's the other beautiful thing. This post I could turn around and put into an email to send to him, you know, if I wanted to. You know, I said, hey, here are five questions that I post. Got a lot of feedback out on LinkedIn and thought you might be interested in seeing it. Boom. What am I doing? I'm, I'm messaging him with value of interest to him because these questions are not, not about me. Not about, no, no, no. It's questions to get him thinking about his business. We have to make every prospect, every prospect message be created, designed, focused on getting the customer to think about their challenges, their problems, because that's how I'm going to be in a position to help them. I think you just, you just highlighted the, the key difference between a successful salesperson and a, an un, unsuccessful or typical salesperson is you're not, you're not pushing, you're selling, you're delivering value. Yeah. You know, let, let me, let me, share with you another real thought that you really want to stop and, and, and think about this from a, from a sales perspective. There are three levels of salespeople out there. One is the customer service person. They're the one who's just, who's just taking care of existing businesses. They're the true farmer. Okay. Then there's another, 
salesperson out there, I know they'll, they'll say they're great, but all they're doing is getting the business. They're getting the business because it's literally handed to them on a silver plate. Here's some new customer that called up. They want this. They, they're just getting a business. The real top of the food chain salesperson is the one who is out there creating business, creating business. What am I trying to do with this person I'm talking to? I'm trying to create business. That's the real mark of a real prospector. Absolutely. And for that, you need to go back to the beginning of our conversation and figure out who to be prospecting. Right, exactly. Because, because otherwise, you're, you're sitting there sending these messages all over the place, and it doesn't mean a thing. So if I'm an early stage company um, with little or none, uh, or little to no brand recognition, how, where should I start? How can I build that, uh, that rapport if they've never heard of me? It starts by first figuring out what, what are my key message points. And what I want to do is I want to create a little bit of an education level with the marketplace. And this is where social media really comes into play. The internet's going to stick around. I think, it's going to, I think one day it's going to be a big thing. So what I do is I create some messaging, which basically, if you think about it, these five questions I put out on LinkedIn this morning are being seen by hopefully hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people. It may just in turn create another prospect for me. Great. I'm happy to. But see, we have to create our media footprint. So I'm going to put out there messages that are going to get people thinking, get people looking at. That's how I start. the. This is what I feel is really the real role of marketing. Marketing is really to create awareness and educate. Then me in sales, I'm going to come along and close the deal. Start the conversation and close the deal. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Now, I, I, I'm happy if marketing starts. I'm happy if marketing starts the conversation. I got no problem with that, but I can't sit here. And then this is where I think a lot of startups really uh, fail on what they feel is they feel that marketing's job is to go get the leads and sales will follow up on them. The problem is every lead generation tool many times winds up being nothing more than this. Um, <laughs> some sort of an email magnet. Hey, download this, get this, you get this, you get this. Well, what do you wind up with is you wind up with a lot of people who probably are not even close to being decision makers. They're just interested in the information. So what happens is you wind up with the leads and, oh, wow, we got, we got hundreds of leads that we can follow up on. Yeah, but I got to go swimming through hundreds of leads to find one. No, 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 no. Marketing, just spend your time creating awareness and educating. I'll do the rest. Yeah, I, I have a pers personal experience from that right now where we're, our company is bringing in thousands of leads a month, but very little of them are actually the decision makers or the, the right people to be speaking to at the right time. Right. And, and the higher the dollar value that you sell or the less frequent the purchase cycle is of what you sell, the more difficult it's going to be for you to attract those type of perfect leads. I learned from it in, in my own company. In my own company, we had this lead generation tool. I had a salesperson, and um, she was not successful at all because all we were getting was salespeople who were in between jobs, starting out the business, low level, whatever it might be, not even close to being the decision maker of who I wanted to be going after. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, it really makes a difference between the pro and the and the uh, beginner in the in their field. All right, so what are some of the common mistakes companies are making when when prospecting that could be easily avoided? Well, one of the biggest mistakes is they fail to fail to follow up on what they start. A um, lot of companies are really good at saying, I'm going to spray out all these phone calls. I'm going to spray out all of these emails. And they think it's one message is going to create. No, uh, it's going to have to be five, six, seven, eight, nine messages before you're going to begin to recognize and you begin to say, hey, let's have this communication. So that's really mistake number one that they make. Mistake number two that companies make is they really don't challenge the prospect or challenge the lead fast enough, which leads to problem number three. What people wind up with is they wind up with what they think are prospects 
but are really nothing more than suspects because they've kept them in their sales pipeline way too long without really pushing them to really qualify them as to whether or not they're going to be a valid potential customer. My objective as a salesperson, and this is going to blow some people's minds away, my objective as a salesperson is not to have this big, fat, wide funnel. No, not at all. I want to have a very narrow funnel because what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to qualify you quickly. So you may start off as a lead, then you become a suspect and you got to earn, you got to earn your way to be a prospect. And, and that means that you've, I've got a level of confidence with you. You have a level of confidence with me. And if I can't create that level of confidence quickly, uh, how am I going to know if there's an opportunity there? I'm not going to know if there's an opportunity there. And as a result, I'm going to wind up wasting a lot of time chasing um, suspects that have zero potential becoming a prospect and becoming a customer. My end goal is I want to have fewer prospects that I can spend more time with. Wow. That is magic. <laughs> Absolutely. I keep trying to tell my reps to, to keep that momentum going. And, and if somebody's not going down that pipeline with you or going down that funnel with you, to push them out, they're, they're not ready yet. Let, let marketing keep warm them up again. And then you, right. you just hey, keep closing. What, what, oh, wow. What you said is so good. Let marketing continue. It's not that you're throwing them out of the system. It's just turn them back over to marketing. Turn them back over to marketing. You can't afford to let your sales pipeline become a sewer pipe. And yet that's what too many salespeople have. They have nothing more than sewer pipes because they're just jammed up with junk. They're, they're afraid to turn down business. Oh, well, they're afraid to turn down no business because that, that, that's really what it is. There's no business there, but they are too gun shy to realize it's not there. See, this is where, I mean, give me five prospects, give me 10 prospects that I can spend a lot of time with, and I'll be able to close a much higher percentage than if you give me a hundred that I really can't deal with, I, I, that I just, I just won't have time to. Yeah, absolutely. Less is more. Less is more. Great. So I want to take, a, take a, a ride down the future and kind of focus on bits from your, your other book, High Profit Selling, Win the Sale Without Compromising on Price. So this is uh, a lot to do with negotiation and, and how you set yourself up as a company uh, and as a salesperson uh, and deliver the value out to the product. So now we've, we've done the prospecting. We've got the people down through the pipeline, and now we're bringing them now towards the discussion of pricing. And dis discounting is a very common practice uh, used by inexperienced salespeople who have failed to deliver the value to the prospect. And many companies will say smaller deal is better than no deal at all. So what do you say to that? Oh, well, wow. You just, you just hit on about five different issues. Let's unpack them here one <laughs> at, at a time. Um, one. The, this whole issue of, of price discounting. Early on in my sales career, I always would complain to my boss, if we just cut the price a little bit, I know I could close this deal. And my boss was too stupid uh, to know otherwise, and he would allow me to discount the deal, and I would close, and I would, you know, he would allow me to discount the price, and I would close the deal. Stupid, stupid, stupid. He should have been pushing back to me and saying, look, idiot, why don't you learn how to sell better? When we have to discount price, it's because we have not done a good job of uncovering value and painting the value, painting the outcome that the customer is going to receive by buying from me. You know, you buy from me, it's, it's a one-time one transaction, but the value really is going to last a lifetime. Now, let's unpack, unpack that a little more. If I do a good enough job prospecting, this is what's very interesting. When I'm in the prospecting phase with you, as soon as I have this level of trust that we talked about earlier, you will begin sharing with me truth. As soon as we start talking price and negotiating a deal, that means now we're into boldface lies because everybody knows, oh, oh, he's negotiating with me. I got to get a better deal. I got to get a better deal. See, so if I prospect right, do it right, I'm going to uncover the full value of what that need is, what that outcome is. So what I always say is that I sell first and negotiate second. See, I'm selling first. And if I do that right, I don't have to negotiate. Now, the way I negotiate 
And, and this is a big mistake that a lot of people make. Negotiations do not have to involve price. They can involve a host of other things. It can be a service that goes along with it. It can be date. It can be delivered. There, there are so many other pieces. Cash is king, especially if you're in a startup. So what I'm going to do, and this, again, comes back to this whole thing, if I'm doing it right in the prospecting phase, I'm uncovering what are those needs that are of value to you. That's what I'm going to zero in on. You may have this critical need that if you buy from me, you need it tomorrow. Well, I may know that, you know, tomorrow I can make that happen at really zero additional cost to me, but it's of high value to you. You see, so what I'm doing is I'm now, yeah, you know what? If we get this purchase order right now, we can get that delivery to you tomorrow. And I know how important it is because getting it tomorrow is going to allow you to do X, 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 you see. And what I'm doing is I'm painting what I'm negotiating with you into the outcome of what you're looking for. And what's beautiful is now I got you thinking, oh, you're right. I got to have this tomorrow. So you jump on it. You agree to it. And it was of zero additional cost where salespeople go wrong. And this, this affects startups so much is that salespeople will sit there and give away things to close a deal that are of high cost to the company. And, and, and again, this comes back to this whole piece that I've got to sit here when I'm, when I'm prospecting with you, when I'm selling with you and begin understanding what are these trip triggers? that may have to come up on the table, that, may that I may have to put out in front of you? And how do I position these in such a way that it's of maximum value to you and of low cost to me? That's how I win without having to discount the sale. Absolutely. And really think outside the box to find those, uh, those, what you could give away uh, instead of price. Uh, I'll share with you a very very quick story. I, I was, uh, had a gentleman who called me, he was owner of a company, wanted me to come in and speak to his sales team. And uh, we had learned through the prospecting phase that one of the reasons they were looking at me because they had a, two new competitors that were coming into the marketplace. So the CEO of the company calls me up and says, we'd like to bring you in, but your fee is really high. Would you cut your fee? And I said, no, I won't cut my fee. And really kind of, kind of concerned with these two new competitors coming into your marketplace. How much of a risk do you think that's going to pose to your business next year? And he stopped and he said, that was really good. I asked you to lower my fee and you got me talking about, you got me thinking about my problem. You're hired. Yeah. You see, it comes back to it's customers don't want to buy. They want to invest. They'll invest to solve a problem. Yeah, it's typically uh, never about price. It's uh, always, it's just something that people are, are wired to do. It's like, okay, now I got to get a discount. Yeah, it just, yeah, we, we all want a discount. So fine, I'll give you a discount. Here's what I can do. I can have this delivery a little bit earlier. I can do this, I can do this. See, again, I can do something that's of zero cost to me, uh, but you perceive it as real value. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, so as a sales rep, um, how, how should a company structure uh, or give the guidelines on pricing and what they can and cannot offer to allow the flexibility with a sales rep? Well, this is really going to sound cold, but I don't think sales reps should have any flexibility with pricing. Whoa, what did he just say? Yes, rewind it. Listen to that again. No flexibility with price. Here, here's why. If you give sales reps flexibility with pricing, it's amazing how often they will use it. If you don't give them flexibility with pricing, it's amazing how they'll find other ways to close the deal. So what I'm going to say is I'm just going to take it off the table. You know, I'm just going to simply take it off the table. Here's other things that you can negotiate with, other, but price is not going to be one of them. Wow. I think that's, uh, that's huge. And people should really think about <laughs> not just the price, like going back to what we said, other value-driven items, but terms could also be very important for a company. 
terms can be huge because maybe cash flow to you is not so critical, but to somebody else it is. I mean, these are all those little things in there. Now, this this is what's interesting. If, if you're a company and you're listening to this and you say, well, gee, we're going to tell our sales force that they no longer have control over pricing. Oh, they'll riot. They'll be rioting in the streets. No arguments there. But they'll get over it. They'll get over it. And then they'll realize if you don't bend and don't bend, because again, salespeople are really good at finding the soft spot. I mean, if you don't bend, they'll figure out a way to sell without having price be an issue. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to close more deals at full margin. Isn't that a beautiful way to spend the day? <laughs> I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm seeing dollar signs floating through my eyes. <laughs> In your book, you're also speaking about going back to existing customers to increase price. Um, now, this is a very sore subject and very tough subject for people to speak about because they're afraid to upset their current existing client base. Uh, but sometimes, you know, they've been a client with you for two, three years and you've improved the product so dramatically and your costs have increased. How can this be done effectively to not upset the clients? Yeah. It yeah, it really is easier than you think. What you do, first of all, if you have a customer, you want to be recording throughout the entire time that they're a customer of yours, all of the outcomes that you've helped them achieve. And you write down the outcome. Hey, maybe you were able to help them with this. You were able to help them with this. And you write down what that outcome is. And then you write down what's the value. Now, don't write down what the value is in terms of what it costs you. Oh, it costs us another $100 to do this. or No, no, what's the value of them? They were able to get their customer taken care of. They were able to write down the value of what it was that you were able to help them with. So what you do then is you come and you have a straight up conversation with the customer. You say, hey, over the last two years, we have been thoroughly appreciative of the business you've given us. And during that time, we've been making kind of a list here of all these different things that we've been able to help you out with. And remember, we helped you out with this, helped you out with this, helped you out with this. One of the critical things is that we want to make sure that we can continue to provide you that level of, you know, this level of service. Because we know it's important that we be in a position to take care of these issues for you. In order for us to do that, we, are in, we need to increase the price to X to allow us to continue to provide you the great service we have. That's how you do it. Do not ask for a price increase. You never ask, uh, I, can, can we take your price up higher? What's the customer going to say? No. You tell the customer, this is what you're going to do. And you give them enough lead time. You give them 30 or 60 days, whatever, whatever the norm is in your industry. Don't be a jerk about it. And you go. And, oh, they'll sit there and say, oh, well, we can't accept that. Well, you know what? They will accept it if what you've been doing is great service. Continue to provide great service, and you'll hold on to the customer. If you were to lose a customer, you know what's very interesting? And I've seen this happen because I've worked through this with many, many customers. A customer might leave, and they go somewhere else, and they're back three months later. Or this is the other piece. Customers will sit there and say they're going to change. Oh, we can no longer buy from you. We're going to buy from somebody else. The cost of conversion to another customer is always much higher than people realize. So they may sit there and then initially, well, we're just going to have to look at alternate suppliers. But then when they begin thinking about it and they go, wow, wow, the cost of converting, the cost of switching, it just isn't worth it. Forget it. We're staying right here with you because you deliver great service. Yeah. And also, if you have a sticky product, that will also help very much. Oh, sticky, sticky, sticky is money, money, <laughs> money. Oh, yeah. Excited. All right. Great. So I want to uh, take a real big sidestep here. And earlier you spoke about uh, that you just put out a, a LinkedIn uh, post. And I actually read it and I thought uh, one of the questions of the five were really Im impactful and really, really important. Uh, and that was number two, which is, I'll, I'll read it out here, is what is the percentage of business I get that is a result of our salespeople creating the opportunity with the customer versus merely getting what they give us? 
So meaning, is our, are our salespeople actually creating value or are this just order takers? Right. Think about that. So many times people think they have a great sales team. No, what they have is a marketplace that's ready to buy. What you have is just order takers. If, if they're not out there creating business, they're not salespeople. So how do you, how can you tell, uh, with the salesperson's creating business, what KPIs are you looking at to, to measure that? Well, trying to ascertain the exact KPIs on that is going to be very, very difficult. But what I look for is, is this salesperson bringing back to me, um, information that other salespeople aren't bringing back. Cause in other words, if, if, I, if, if I'm going to create opportunities in order for me to create opportunities, there has to be an exchange of information that isn't occurring with those salespeople who are just getting, or those salespeople who are just servicing. So really it's not as so much a KPI as I can measure a number as it's kind of, what am I learning? And that's how I'm going to be go, going to be able to measure the, um, Absolute KPI, very difficult to come up with for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> especially with the different kinds of businesses and, and especially in the startup world as uh, there's not a lot of measurement happening. Right. And, and, and let's talk about that for a second because it's too easy for us to measure something just because it can be measured. Just because it can be measured doesn't mean it should be measured. Yeah, very true. I think one of the, a lot of people get caught up with that is just like, oh, let's look at the numbers. Let's look at how many calls you made, how many hours in the office you were, uh, and things like that. Now, typically there's a, a correlation, correlation, but it doesn't mean causation. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting, most of those measurements are historic measurements. They're not leading indicators. And what we got to be doing is we got to be saying, how do we look at leading indicators? That's why I look at trend lines, you know, uh, a KPI that I like is customer facing time, measuring customer facing time. And is that trend line increasing? If that trend line's not increasing, I got a problem. You know, another KPI that I like is what are the number of sales calls? Okay, that's, that in and of itself is historic, but what's the trend line over several months? That can begin to provide me with a leading indicator as to where, where this salesperson should be performing two, three, four months from now. Yeah. And so what, when you're looking at these trend indicators, what kind of things are you actually looking at? The, the, biggest, the biggest one that I look at is not so much what comes in the top of the funnel. I could care less what comes in the top of the funnel. I want to look at what is the percentage of deals that get closed coming out the bottom. In other words, I may have a three, four step process in my sales pipeline. Number one is lead. Number two is qualifying the prospect. What I want to look at is what's the percent of deals that get closed from after the person's qualified as a prospect and close the deal. That is, to me, that's a real strong KPI. So Mark, uh, we're running out of time here and I really want to, uh, want to thank you for joining us. Is there a way for people to reach out to you? Well, yeah, the best way is, yes, my name is Mark Hunter, but I'm known as The Sales Hunter. And the website is thesaleshunter.com is the best way to reach me. I'm all over social media, but I kind of start with, start with the website. And of course, the two books are High Profit Prospecting and High Profit Selling. And I really encourage you to pick up, pick up both of them. Yeah, they're, they're on Amazon, uh, on Amazon Kindle as well. Yes. <laughs> Great. Mark, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Startup Sales with Adam Springer. Subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. To contact Adam about consulting services or speaking engagements, visit StartupSalesPodcast.com or email StartupSalesPodcast at gmail.com. Okay, Mark, let's uh, finish up with the final five. Oh, let's go for it. Besides your own, what is your favorite sales or leadership book? My favorite sales or leadership book would be uh, Win Friends and Influence People. Who do you follow uh, for sales and leadership ideas? I follow a wide range of people out there, both in B2B and B2C. Um, some of the people I like the most are really a couple people who I'm 
very strong peers with Mike Weinberg, Anthony Inarino, and Jeb Blunt. Um, the four of us, I admit, we're good friends, but we're good friends because we're, we're great sales peers together. Excellent. Um, now, this is a little different because typically I'm asking sales leaders or founders, um, but when you were in that stage of your career, uh, were you, or even now, are you available 24 seven or do you have strict personal time boundaries? Oh, 24 seven. When I was in the startup phase, 24 seven and even now, okay, maybe I'm not 24 seven, maybe I'm 23.99 seven. <laughs> I don't think you can be successful and I don't think you can really separate. I don't think you can separate the two. I love what I do. I thoroughly love what I do. There you go. If you love what you do, you never work. And, and, right. and, and every other cliche. Good. Uh, what tool uh, are you use? What is your favorite tool used for sales? My favorite tool is probably Evernote. I use Evernote for literally everything. And, How? Uh, I record. I have a file on each one of my clients. I use it for my prospecting standpoint. I use it for project management. I use it for literally everything. And the, the second greatest tool, or maybe it is the first tool, is a really good cup of coffee. <laughs> a little bit of caffeine kick. Uh, no, a lot of caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> good. All right, last question is, what one piece of advice do you have for all the founders, CEOs, and sales leaders out there? Be open. Be open and receptive to other people and other ideas. Never think for a moment that the idea you have is a perfect idea. I never want to walk into a room and be the smartest person. I don't have that problem. I don't care who you are. Always be seeking outside counsel. Great. Be open to others', others advice. Mark, thanks again so much for joining us. Thank you and great selling.